Well, thank you, Daryl. Uh, please let me know if you guys can't hear me. Um, not only am I virtual, I'm also wearing headphones, so I sound like I'm talking into a five-gallon bucket. So if you uh, have troubles hearing me, please let me know. Thank you for that great introduction. I apologize, first of all, for uh, being a little soft in my getting older age. Don't like cold weather as much as I used to, and the sub-zero temps along with the road conditions, I just decided to stay stay close to home. So I appreciate you allowing me to do this virtually. Uh, as uh, Daryl said, I am the uh, Chief Agronomy Operations Officer for Jorgensen Land and Cattle. I have three partners in my business, and that is my brother, Greg, my nephew, Cody, and my son, Nick. And uh, Nick and Cody are the younger ones, and they're really starting to really drive the operation forward from where it is. And Greg and I are starting to back away. And uh, I was fortunate in that my father, Martin, who passed away a couple of years ago, but he had the vision to allow younger people the younger generations to take a hold and, and run with things. So 30 some years ago, I was given a lot of opportunity on our operation to do a lot of things differently. And it uh, partially led to our success along with the, of course, the cattle operation, which I've had, I have very little to do with, but my passions are certainly around the operation of the, of the agronomy. Uh, we are a fourth generation uh, operation. We have five generations on the ground. I have nine grandchildren myself, and five of those are boys. Four of them are Nick's boys. And so, uh, and Cody also has two sons and a daughter. And <clears throat> so there's potential for this farm to carry forward is quite high. And we have it in our mission statement, in our vision statements that uh, we try and pass on the legacies that were handed to us in better condition than the, than we took them over. So this is a picture of our farm operation back in about 1939 when my grandfather moved on to it from his homestead. Those buildings are all but gone today, but uh, uh, what's replaced it is, is much more modern and, and, of course, more efficient. Today, we farm about... 12,000 acres of cropland. And within that, uh, you can see we have quite a range of different crops. And <clears throat> this is probably one of the reasons for the success of our soil health journey is the diversity and the different things that we grow. And if it weren't for the cattle operation, that leads me to these different, uh, this more diverse opportunity I don't think we would be as successful. If we were just a grain farm, it would be harder for us to do all these different crops. But as a whole, uh, winter wheat is uh, probably our most dominant crop. We are in a very strong winter wheat area of South Dakota. Uh, as a child, I grew up farming uh, wheat fallow and maybe a little bit of milo but I can remember as a young boy and into my teens working summer fallow in the summer. I'd have hated that. It was a very boring job. And uh, when I finally took over the operations in the mid 1980s, our soil organic matters were in the mid or lower one percentile. So, and I didn't know at that time, but uh, the soils were in pretty tough shape. But as you can see, this, this is a pretty dynamic range of different crops. Uh, about 75% of what we grow ends up in the form of cattle feed, either in the form of uh, taking, the, taking the crop to uh, the storage areas or for grazing opportunities. And then also we do have uh, wheat, spring wheat, oats, and soybeans as cash crops. We're also blessed to have about 8,800 8, acres of native uh, prairie pasture. And this is kind of my, my biggest opportunity, I think, to learn the benefits of soil health. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, we're really blessed to have these acres. They really 
they they are suitable for farm ground. Uh, they're they're pretty rolly and pretty rough, but uh, they've been a wonderful proving ground for a lot of the soil health practices that we've employed. In fact, we've learned a lot about how to do things by visually watching and observing the pastures. And since we won the Leopold Award in the mid, well, it was 2015, we have really ramped up our management of these pastures. And so we've really seen the last couple of years, and in fact, last year, 2021, was a tough, dry year, the benefits of uh, intense management of these pastures, and they really flourish when you put some good management practices behind them. We have about 1,000 to 1,100 head of Angus cows. Uh, most of those are registered. Some are commercial recipient cows for embryos. But by and large, uh, that's the extent of our, our cow herd. We have currently a 4,000 head confined animal feeding or CAFO feedlot at our main headquarters. And from that, uh, we market about 4,500 Angus bulls annually, either through a lease program or a direct purchase. And that, that market is growing significantly. That's, this is really the, the thrust of our op entire operation is the, the bull marketing business. Uh, this year will be the eighth year that we've been the number one uh, beef seed stock supplier uh, that, and in the United States, and I would probably argue in the world. We also have a certified seed business. Um, we grow and sell about 25,000 plus bushels of winter wheat every year, about 15,000 bushels of spring wheat, and about 60,000 bushels of oats. And as Daryl mentioned, we also have our Lazy J Grand Lodge, which we built 10 years ago. Um, we are in a very rich area for uh, wild bird populations, although those populations diminished significantly in the last decade or so. Uh, so we have now two preserves within and around that lodge that we use to release birds and do the hunting. We also do corporate events, weddings, all kinds of different things. It's a, it's a very beautiful place and we would love to have uh, any of you come down and see it anytime. The thrust of my talk today is really going to be about carbon management. And I believe that that's going to be the real next revolution in agriculture. As, as I started my career in the early 1980s, it wasn't until about the mid 1990s when the GMO revolution hit us. And that was in itself a, a, a huge revolution or change in agriculture and the way we did things. But I do believe that the carbon management aspect of as we learn more of how to do this and manage it, it's going to be far bigger than anything we've ever seen in terms of how it can impact uh, production agriculture. And we can do this, this is going to happen through a number of mechanisms. It's all going to be soil health driven, I believe. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to sell the concept of, you know, carbon credits and so forth, but that's going to be a ball game that everybody's going to want a piece of. But as producers, I believe that we can see the benefits of carbon management through, through soil health driven management itself and reducing carbon movement. You know, we, we talk a lot about uh, producing and grain and then shipping it all over the world. Well, that's fine, but just remember that when we take a train load of soybeans to the, to the Gulf Coast or to the Pacific Northwest Coast and ship it away, we're, we're shipping and exporting nutrients as well. So I would encourage people to think about not moving carbon so far and keeping it closer to home and building the economies around that. It's also going to involve lowering input loads, and that's reducing the amount of applied nutrient that we're putting out there. That's been a major thrust in our operation since the mid-1990s. Uh, we don't look at soil tests as a, a way to figure out how much nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium we put out there, but rather a chemical balance of that soil and then work towards applying less of those uh, inputs as we need them. Also using biology, and foliar feeding have been become an integral part of our operation. 
as Joel so eloquently uh, showed us this morning, uh, the biology factor is is enormous. It's the it's the really it's the to me it's the silver bullet or the the secret to the success of building the soil health profile. If you can feed the biology and 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 manage the biology in such a way, your soils would become more more efficient, and it takes less inputs to do the same thing. Diversifying crop species is going to be very important. Livestock integration, we are learning very quickly that that's a very, uh, very suitable way to increase soil health and also cut a lot of costs. It's going to become less about sustainable ag and really more about regenerative ag. And I don't really like the word sustainable. It means really that you have a status quo or you're going to sustain the way you, you've been doing it. And the regenerative ag movement is big and it's getting bigger. So let's keep our eyes on that. Our journey uh, began in the mid 1980s. Uh, we began implementing no-till practices on some of the crops to save moisture and time. And that really was at a time when our operation was starting to grow pretty quickly. And we knew that tillage was uh, something that was becoming harder and harder to do because of the expanded acres uh, and, and not enough labor. And so we found out real quick that the no-till helped us a lot in terms of fewer practices across the fields, fewer trips across the fields. It was saving us not only time, but it was saving us moisture too. And so by 1991, we expanded to 100% no-till. Every crop every year was no-till. We haven't, we haven't touched the chisel or a disc uh, in any of our practical fields since that time. And incidentally, that was when my first child, my son Nick, was born in 1991. So he'll talk about in his, his talks about he doesn't know what tillage is. He just never experienced it. All he's ever known is the no-till system. And so as I find that interesting, I never really thought of it in those terms, but he's, that's all he's ever known. We weren't really looking to improve soil health at that time. It wasn't really on our radar. It was really driven by saving moisture and the economics, saving fuel and saving time. But as we began to expand our crop diversity to meet those, the needs of the farm and also the needs of the system, we learned very quickly that we were saving additional moisture. We had to be able to utilize that moisture. If we didn't, the system would start to fall apart. In other words, you can only hold so much water, even though you may not uh, get the, the rains when you want them. The soil had the ability to hold and lock those, that moisture in. But if you didn't use it, it led to more problems. So it led to a, a changing the crop diversity. And I have to be honest, if it weren't for the efforts of Dwayne Beck, uh, a lot of that would probably never have happened. So I have to give him a lot of credit. By the mid 1990s, we really saw uh, a need to uh, changed the way our fertility system had, was, was being done. And <clears throat> honestly, we were relying on co-ops and soil tests to tell us how much a nutrient need to be applied. And we frankly didn't feel like it was getting us or gaining us any ground. Uh, I felt like we were just putting a lot of nutrient out there without uh, uh, an obvious benefit or an obvious return. So we turned to a system that relied less upon applied nutrients and more with biostimulants and the right types of fertilizers at the right time. So all the things that are being talked about today, what used to be talked about as snake oil, we've been doing since the mid 1990s. And it was at that time that we began to really understand about soil balance and saw improved soil health as a true benefit. And we'll talk about this soil balance in a little bit, little bit later. And since that time, our yields have steadily increased over time. And while at the same time, our cost per unit has remained stable or reduced. This is my, as I said before, the prairie system is one of my greatest teachers. And then as we observe it, we realize that the prairie systems have been doing what they've done for thousands and thousands of years without hardly any inputs of, uh, from the humankind anyway. Uh, if we've never tilled the soils and if those prairie soils are treated and managed properly, they'll survive many, many millennia. 
And why is that? Well, they have all the components that Mother Nature wants us to look at and to understand, and that's why they survive. And they have natural nature's natural rotation. Nowhere in nature do you see a monoculture. Mother Nature doesn't grow just one crop in the soil. She has many different species. Uh, so they have a natural rotation. The organic matters in those soils are, are naturally high, four to 7% in our area. And that's something that is extremely important in, in determining the success of your soil health system or your no-till systems. Remember that the system, the, the prairie systems have both warm and cool season grasses and warm and cool season broadleaves and legumes. Natural nutrient cycle. So you have the living root 365 days a year that you have this natural system of, of cycling the nutrients that are, are given to that soil, either through photosynthesis or through the, de the deposition of manures from the cattle. All those nutrients are naturally cycled. We also have a very bioactive soil. In other words, there's a lot of different biology naturally present in that soil all the time that lives in, in synchronicity with that system. We have the perfect soil and plant interaction. It's mother nature's perfect system. And it has proven sustainability with livestock integration. Interestingly enough, without the livestock, we've had some landlords that had pasture that they took, they made us take the livestock away because they felt like it was hurting the habitat for the pheasants and the deer. So we took the cattle away and within about five or six years, their pasture started to turn to brome grass and it took about 10 years to recover them from that damage. Following mother, mother Nature's lead, remember that the soil always, always eats first, and then the soil then feeds the plants. The plants then feeds the soil. One cannot survive in nature without the other. And I think a lot of the science was illustrated this morning in Joel's presentations about that. I have to go back to this. Every time I think about a system, I have to think about Jay Fuhrer and the five basic principles of soil health. And it's so, so important. We talk about this at the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition a lot. And when you, when you start thinking about management practices, if you don't think about these five things, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Soil armor is so so critically important for protecting that soil, just like the skin in our bodies. It protects, that, protects the soil from the elements. Number two is the limit of the disturbance of soil. It's the no-till systems. Uh, the less we have, the more likely we are to promote soil health. Plant diversity, just like in nature, we have many, many different species simultaneously working in that system. Living roots, like a prairie system, we have 365 days a year of a living root in that soil. And most importantly, I think, is the, is the integration of livestock. So I have to give Jay a lot of credit. This is a, a great, simple way of, of just gauging how much a producer is doing and the management changes that he, he or she wants to do. If they fall within these, then there's going to be a high level of success. How do we develop our rotations? A lot of it's driven by the, <clears throat> the needs of feed in our operation. As I mentioned, about 70 to 75% of what we grow ends up in the form of feed or grazing needs of our cattle. What else drives it? The cost of unit of production. If, if a crop doesn't return us a certain amount per unit, then we change to something else. Seed demand. Uh, this year is a good example of very few people have spring wheat or oats for sale because there was such a limited production in 2021. So obviously that's gonna carry some into next year as well into determining how many acres of that we, we grow. The wildlife needs obviously uh, that has an impact on my decisions of what to grow where. Uh, labor and equipment storage, how much dry grain storage do we have? How much forage storage do we have going into another year is going to determine the balance in that rotation. And obviously weather is going to play a huge factor. Uh, we are coming into a pretty uh, a dry look right now. I mean, we have some sub moisture because we had some late fall moisture, but uh, if we have another 2021, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be an interesting year to say the least. 
And again, every time we think about rotation of development, I have to go back to the five soil health principles and do they fit those, those, those aspects of the, of the soil health principles. My general rule of thumb is two years in of any given crop type and at least two years to four years away from that crop type. Uh, we're not doing a lot of companion cropping yet. Uh, we've talked about doing some, we've tried a little bit of it, but we've seen that this five to six year rotation for us has worked very, very well. An example of those rotations would be an oats to a winter wheat, to a cover crop, to a corn, and then to a corn or a milo, and then to a soybean, a pea or an alfalfa, and then repeat. And there are very many variations to that. Spring wheat, to a winter wheat, to a cover crop, to a corn, to a forage sorghum mix, to an oat pea, to a winter wheat. So within these areas here, there's a lot of uh, variations that we can put in there. But the, I, the main thrust of, the, of my point is that we have a lot of diversity and we have a very long, elongated rotation here, which lends itself to weed control and disease control as well. Cover crops are a, an enormous part of that rotation. As you noticed within those that always following winter wheat, uh, if we can graze it, we're going to have cover crop behind that winter wheat. And that, if you think about that's for us is the best opportunity because of our, our growing season uh, that gives us from July until October to grow a, a keep a living root and uh, a, a cycling system in that soil. And so that's been where our, our highest level of success has come from is the cover crops behind the winter wheat. The reason we like them is they cycle excess nutrients that may be present in the system. Uh, they also use excess soil water, which often is not the case, but there have been years where we've had too much water and, this, and the cover crops really help us utilize the excess water. And the living root gives us uh, the ability to get on those soils when they're wet with heavier equipment with less damage. It's obviously, it's, it's a living root that we've taken and extended the life from that winter wheat crop on as far as we can into October. We saw dramatic increases in the conditioning of our soil because of that living root present. It obviously becomes a bio-friendly host because we have, again, a living root. And it's a diverse uh, set of roots that uh, we can uh, host many different kinds of biome. It creates habitat for wildlife, such as pheasants, deer, and so on. <clears throat> it competes with all weeds, and even those that are uh, resistant to many herbicides. And when you compete with weeds, they have a tendency not to show up as often. Mother Nature's always going to put something there. So if the cover crop wasn't there, the weeds would be. And because of that, we've lowered our herbicide needs significantly. And it promotes beneficial insects, and creates a great grazing opportunity for us. What, where, and when our cover crop cocktails include cool and warm season grasses, brassicas, legumes, and pollinators, just about the whole gamut. And they're usually directly behind winter wheat. We are experimenting with companion cropping, but we've had limited success with that. The only time that we really have success with that is forage crops such as peas and oats or triticale and peas. And now we're experimenting with winter wheat forage and, uh, is pea and peas as well. Full season covers for intense grazing. We've done a couple of years of those, but uh, through the studies that we've done uh, from a soil health aspect, they're great, but we believe that we be better served to take a crop off and then do a followed up with a cover crop uh, it's it, we're going to be money ahead to do it that way versus uh, putting that uh, acre of ground into a full season grazing. Always remember that you can plant anytime there's an opportunity with up to four to five weeks before a killing frost. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. If you remember what Joel said this morning about organic matter and where a lot of the biomass comes from is obviously in the root. So uh, if we can establish a good root system, we're going to be beneficial, creating a benefit. Management tips, 
multiple species are extremely important. Again, in nature, uh, she is not a monoculture, so she likes multiple different species. Always pay attention to your carbon nitrogen ratio. We like to see it at least 20 to one. Try and incorporate at least one to two legumes. Allow five to six weeks before killing frost. Uh, avoid residual herbicides on the previous crop. Plan ahead. It does take planning, guys. You gotta think about what you're doing before you plant that cover crop. Uh, if you plant something out there that uh, may not like the herbicide that you used on the previous crop, you're gonna be wasting your lot of your money. Plant shallow, one inch into moisture. If you don't plan on grazing it or haying it, consider flattening it to aid in decomposition. And please don't fertilize it. Let them scavenge. Capturing the nutrients. This is a quick study that we did about 10 years ago. Uh, we had a quarter of winter wheat. After it was harvested, we took a soil test. We planted half of it to cover and left the other half bare. This is the result when we took the test later that winter where we had the cover crop, you can see our organic matter was about a full half a percent higher, which is about 10,000 pounds of residue just from the cover crop. We gained an additional 20 pounds of nitrogen. We increased the soil water holding capacity by over a half an inch, uh, the ability for that soil to hold more rain, greatly improved the soil structure, and we did not see any negative impact on the yield on the next crop. This is that same test where we had no cover crop. We had about uh, 55 pounds of nitrate in that soil. Uh, where we planted the cover crop, we had about 15. That's, that sounds bad to me, that's good because nitrate's a mobile nutrient and it's unstable. In other words, it may or may not be uh, in a beneficial area for that following crop the next year. This had been cycled and turned basically to organic, organic nutrients. So, for us, it's a lot more useful. This is phosphorus. Uh, I run on very low phosphates. Uh, you know, we talk about that in a minute, but you can see where the winter wheat had no cover. There was about a little over 10 pounds of P1 available. Where we had the cover crops, we had a release because of the biology. So we actually gained about eight pounds of phosphate. A P1, just because we had the micronutrient or the microorganisms out there releasing uh, the P2 form. Economic soil health, uh, lower production costs. We've lowered our applied nutrient levels significantly over time. We've improved our soil structure. We capture more moisture. We have healthier crops and therefore we have healthier livestock. The influence of uh, no-till and soil half practices on, on the Jorgensen land and cattle's economics. We've reduced our commercial fertilizer applications significantly over time. We have not applied any dry phosphate since the mid-1990s. Uh, we only use between six and 12 pounds of an orthophosphate in furrow on most of our crops. Uh, about half to two thirds rate of what universities would recommend of nitrogen and we only use that form of nitrogen in U, uh, urea ammonium nitrate or ammonium thiosulfate. We don't use any dry urea. All nutrient applications are row directed, streamed or fully or applied, which brings in about 30% more efficiency. We've also been able to reduce our herbicide and fungicide use. We've reduced our equipment costs from fewer passes across each acre uh, than conventional tillage systems. We've increased planting and harvest windows because we have so many different crops, we can do more with uh, one or two air seeders versus having a lot of acres of a single crop. That means we can spread out our use of our equipment. The use savings that we've seen from all these, we've been able to apply a lot more biological and foliar type products to our plants, uh, which has led us to really understand how the biological portions of our soils are so important. And we've been able to reduce our feed costs for livestock significantly. Organic matter matters. Uh, we, we stress a lot. We put a lot of importance on trying to build this, uh, this organic matter every year. When I took over the farm, the whole farm average was below one and a half percent. Our long term average today is 3.7%. You can see by this graph that last year it was over almost 5%. It dropped a lot this last year because of our drought, but you can see the trend line as we went along here, the last since 2009. 
that's something that we strive to do every year because we believe it's so important. The higher the organic matter percent, the more biology can be supported. For every 1% gain, we capture 20 to 40 pounds of nitrogen. With each 1% increase, we gain another inch of water storage capacity. We avoid stacking low carbon crops. And as I mentioned before, the native prairie soils are about 5%. So that's our goal. Soil test, uh, the way you look at a soil test is the first thing I look at is uh, where's our organic matter. We strive to be greater than 3%, which we are. Uh, again, we talked about the savings that we can incur by having the amount of nitrogen that's available in, those, in that organic matter. It provides the fuel for the soil microbes and it also gives the water more, uh, soil more water holding capacity. Phosphorus is one of those that I, I stress a lot when I talk. I don't apply much phosphorus in our native systems, our native prairies. We generally see about five to 10 parts per million in a native scenario. And that's where we are today with our soils is about five parts per million. Our P2 portion, which is the unavailable portion, usually runs about 30 parts per million. And through biology, that's what we're garnering most of our uh, phosphate from. And if it is more info, uh, we have a huge influence of our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. So we, we try and plant crops that are friendly to those. Base saturation, this is the second thing I look at in the soil test. If these numbers fall within these ranges, that's gonna lead to a lot more success in your soil health journey, just because that's the balance that the microbes tend to like. Uh, and a lot of times what we've seen where there's been a lot of dry fertilizers applied or excess amounts of nutrients, these sodium levels become more than one or 2% that can be detrimental to the, the biology. So that's one that you really wanna watch. Grazing livestock, we love the rumen. It's one of the best harvesters known to man. Uh, the, the cattle for us cycle the residues to feed the system utilize cover crops or excess residues. They lower feeding costs. They're a key factor, I believe, in my opinion, in the overall soil health improvement. And they promote good overall animal health. This is a study, actually, it's just, a, it's not really a study. It's just what we've observed in 2021. This year, we had about 800 bulls between October 1st and which will be March 1st. There's still a lot of bulls out yet as, as, we, as I talked today. Uh, we look at that one bull per day is a grazing day. So we had about 110,000 total grazing days on cropland and residues in 2021. And we grazed a total of about 2,880 acres. The cost per day for grazing those animals was about 74 cents. The cost per day in a feedlot situation is $2.83. The cost savings from grazing is about $2.09. So the total cost savings during that time period for us was $229,000, almost $230,000. And if you put that back on a per head basis, that's $300 per head or $80 an acre. And incidentally, that $80 an acre is about what we pay for rent. So it covers the rent on those acres. This is a chart that shows what we've observed in organic matters from soil test. The, the, the light green line is the, is the line that shows those acres that were grazed uh, from the period of time from 2014 until current. You can see that the organic matter levels are higher on those acres that were grazed versus those that were not. And we see that time and time again. To close up my, my presentation today, healthy soils, we've got to pass it on. We really don't own the land resource, but rather consider it a long-term lease with the next generation. Let's make sure they get their soil back in better shape than when we get it. Incidentally, this is an older picture of Nick's two oldest boys. He now has two set of twins uh, that are going to probably going to be farming with these guys. So it behooves me to pass it on in better condition than when I took it over. I think I've taken more than enough time. I hope to hear some questions later. Thank you. Let's give Brian a hand. Thank you very much.